And once you've got consistency, you're in business because, you know, you're up and you're running and then they can start to impact and change the things like mechanics. Well, sh these things are long-term things. This is a short-term thing. And once they're up and running, this will start to change and this will start to change. And I think as coaches, we then have a responsibility to either target short-term success or long-term success. And the reason I've got Chris Clark's picture up there is everybody knows who Chris Clark is. Just ran 20.2 at the back end of this year. Um, I've got two reasons why I've got his picture up. The first thing is this guy, would, as a sort of 15-year-old, beat Cranny James to run the 400 meters at the world use. You know, incredibly gifted youngster who, in my opinion, the environment he's is, they chased after short-term success. Um, and because he was so prodigious as a young, youngster, they then decided that they were going to continue to push for success in the 400 meters, put him into a program which was based around fitness, which was based around getting short-term results, and then all of a sudden he stopped running fast over the 400 meters, and he stopped running fast over the 200 meters, and he stopped running fast over the 100 meters, and athletics became a very horrible place for him to be around, and you know, there was a lot of expectation which he couldn't deal with, and all of a sudden we've just lost probably the most talented you know, youth athlete we ever had. You know, this guy ran 10-4, 20.8, 45-5 as an 18-year-old. I mean, those numbers are, you know, unheard of and probably, you know, are better than any other numbers in the world or something of that age. But, again, chased after short-term success and we nearly broke him. And lucky enough, we've been able to sort of turn him around a little bit, but it's, it's going to be a hard process of, of building his confidence up. And, you know, one of the things that, that I've done is I've, I've, I've chosen the long-term route with this guy and decided that if he is going to be world-class over the 400 meters, then I need to get him to be world-class over the 200 meters. And, you know, we've taken him back and stripped back his training, worked a little bit more on mechanics, worked a little bit more on technique, you know, and, you know, we started to sort of see that change throughout the season. And again, he ran 20.2 in, in the space of 70 minutes twice. Um, and sort of showed evidence that it, it can turn around and, and we sort of can build a foundation for the future. But, uh, you know, one of the sort of lessons I learned from that is that, you know, if he had done that when he was 15 or when he was 16 or he was 17, he would now be in business to run a world-class 400. But we're having to, to revisit it. And I think we see it a lot with our athletes, you know, prodigiously talented as 15, 16, 17-year-old kids. Then they come into their sort of early 20s you know, and all of a sudden we lose them. Um, and then we could potentially lose them to the sport. But we can't really afford to lose guys like Chris Clark. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're too gifted and they're too special. And we need to find a way to be a little bit more individualized around them and try and bring them back into the sport. And the, I mean, the other thing that really sort of gets me is that, um, like, people... People slag off Clarky, you know, say he hasn't got the right mentality you know, or he, he hasn't got the big, the big race mentality or any of those things. And I think, personally, I think that stuff is a load of rubbish. I think, you know, the reason that athletes have confidence is because they're in a good training program. Um, and I think sometimes the, athlete, the reason the athletes don't have confidence in themselves is because the coach isn't doing good, a good enough job. And, and they've been misread and they're misunderstood. And I think sometimes athletes get absolutely destroyed in the press and the media when they're unsuccessful, when they don't, aren't perceived to be coming through the potential. And I think athletes get a really raw deal, and I think we as coaches need to take a big responsibility and say we're at fault. We're the ones that are putting our guys out there. We're unprepared, you know, and we can't blame anybody else but blame ourselves. And, you know, Clarkie's an example of that to me because at the end of the season, I made a mistake in Newcastle. I'm not sure if anybody saw the Newcastle 150-meter race. Clarkie did four of his fastest races in the history of his life in the space of six weeks, and then there was an opportunity for him to run in Newcastle, and I made, I made him race. And, uh, you know, he pulled up halfway through with, you know, a small sort of hamstring injury. But, you know, it was a big lesson to me. You know, I misunderstood him, and uh, I didn't understand him. And that's what's been happening his whole career. And... You know, he phoned me up middle of the week on that particular race and he said to me, um, Coach, I, I don't think I'm ready to, to run this weekend. And I went, well, what do you mean? And he went, well, something, something isn't right. And I was like, well, man, like, you're in the race and, you know, people expect you to run, so you better come up here and run. And, you know, it just made me think again that, 
these athletes are pretty special, and he's got a pretty bit special sort of feeling. But the problem with these guys sometimes is they can't articulate it. They can't get across what it is, their feeling and all the rest of it. And one of the things I learned that day was that, uh, you know, sometimes you've got to read the signs. You've got to read the little signals that people make, you know. And um, what I've noticed coaching the group of athletes that I coach is that some of the non-verbal stuff is very, very important. Some of the stuff they, they present with at the track is telling you exactly what you need to do in that particular day, you know. And... Um, so one of the things that James is very, very good at, he's very good at, with his hands, he'll point and he'll be pressing and touching throughout his warm-up, the areas that are actually quite tight on that particular day. And as a coach, I think you've got to be really, you know, observe, really tap in to the way they're moving, to what they're doing with their hands, to the things they're not saying and aren't able to articulate. Um, because these guys have got very, very good um, motor systems that sometimes they're ability to articulate what the motor system is saying isn't quite as good. So you've got them healthy, you've got them training consistently, consistently. then I think you've got to, to figure out and refine their training a little bit. And I think once you've got that base and you've got them healthy and consistent, you then need to figure out how to make them to run fast because that's what gives them the confidence is is, is running fast and there's a couple of things that I think are really important to figure out intensity frequency rest training blocks and comp blocks So, like, intensity is a, it's the, the most important thing to, to gauge right. How much intensity do I give my athlete? How much can they cope? And I think every athlete is different. Um, James is a guy who likes to have two big blocks of intensity in a training week. Um, but Johnny Peacock, who's another guy coach, who runs at a, a slower speed, he likes to have smaller bits of intensity more frequently throughout the week. And, you know, I think it's really important to try and tap in to understand why, why that happens. You know, James is a guy that's running 9-9 nine, 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 and Johnny's a guy that's running 10-8. So it makes sense that if James runs a training session, he's going to need longer to recover before he then runs a fast training session again. And it's, it's tapping into those rhythms, whereas Johnny's running slower. So if you give him a particular training session, then he doesn't need as much recovery as somebody like James does. So it's starting to really tap into how much intensity people need. Um, Chris and Leon are are 200 meter guys who I think if you give them too much intensity it fries their system pretty quickly and um, you know I came to the conclusion that with Clarky this year that he could only manage one intense session every 10 days um, you know and in that 10 day period you needed to give him certain types of rhythmical stuff certain types of training sessions which allowed him to recover neurally before I hit him again so I guess the message I'm trying to get across is that with each athlete that you have in your training group, it's very important to figure out what it is intensity-wise they can take and then figure out what is the next recovery period before I can hit them again with that intense session. And I think once you start to tap into that sort of stuff, then you can start to individualize a lot more and you can get a lot more, more, more from each of your workouts. Frequency, again, it's really important, I think, to... to some athletes on a sort of motor learning sort of level kind of need a little bit more sort of frequency of activities happening throughout the week. They need, if for example, they're trying to learn, you know, how to start or they're trying to learn a block start, then sometimes, you know, they need to be doing it every second day. They need to be touching base with that skill set every second day. Other athletes are completely different. Um, and I think it's, it's learning that some athletes like small doses of work done very frequently and others, others like I said, possibly can survive off two big bouts in one week and, and, and don't need it as much. But again, it's about tapping into to that. Johnny, for example, needs to be able to do some form of a block start every four, four, uh, four times a week, just so he can feel it, just so he can remind himself. You know, and there's a lot of variables for him to deal with, with, with his leg situation and all the rest of it, but that, that sort of suits him. I think rest is um, absolutely 100%, you know, the biggest thing that you need to get right with each individual athlete. You need to start tapping into how much rest does this athlete need? need? What does that rest look like? What are the sort of things that, that I can do 
which is actually going to allow his system to recover and promote recovery. So, you know, after a key workout, you know, we generally build a sort of, there's a, for each athlete, I try to build an idea in my head, um, what the next couple of days will look like for that athlete. And for some athletes, that's, you know, two days rest before I get, that, get them to run again. For others, it's one day rest. And, you know, for some, it's, it's as much as five days rest. And, <laughs> You know, when they get into the competition season, that's when it starts to get really complicated. And when they do things like James done when he ran 991, it starts to get even more complicated. So, you know, I go back to the intensity thing. The faster they run, the more rest that they're going to need. You know, so when James ran 991, he probably needed to run about 30 days recovery. <laughs> and, you know, I think uh, it's very hard to... Um, sort of figure these things out going forward but looking back it's quite easy to figure stuff out but uh, you know I think there's a lot of issues out there where everybody's opinion has been skewed by the fact that we have Jamaicans and Americans constantly run under 10 seconds and I, I just don't think the human body is you know has an ability to do that on a regular consistent basis and um, I think what I've learned this year is that the human body is a very sort of um, susceptible to intensity and every time you take that that body to a new place you, you, you have to really really think about how long you give them before they open up again how long you put them back in that environment and the sort of the sort of underlying subtle signs of intensity are so easy to miss and um, I think we're too quick to, to bring people back in and get them back in spikes and do the next big workout and all those sort of things. So I think the message is that, you know, is to learn that if your athletes are, are doing extremely well and they're running extremely fast, is to never, never underestimate the importance of this because it quickly falls off the track quite easily if you don't get that right. Training blocks is another interesting thing I've kind of learned throughout the sort of last few years. And um, what I've generally found is that Guys like Richard who are getting the job done through more physiological sort of methods rather than sort of neural sort of methods. These guys actually like um, big elongated training blocks and they like short competition blocks. Um, so just to... So... Richard was always a successful indoor runner, and people were like, why is he so successful over the indoors? And for me, the reason was quite simple. Indoor period was almost a very, very short competition block, which allowed him to have a massive elongated winter, which would, you know, basically fill up his petrol tank. So by the time he started competing, he had enough petrol in his tank all the way through the season. But the further these guys get away from the end of this and they start competing, the petrol tank quickly starts to, to run out. And... Um, it's very important to sort of realize that and try and keep that up as, as, as full as possible. The other guys, the Chris Clarks and the Jameses of the world, those guys are the complete opposite, I found. They like short training blocks and they like elongated comp blocks. And I think the reason for me is quite simple. Like James will always start every season, indoor or outdoor, with... Like, uh, you start with 10.14, start with 6.60, and um, you start with 10.18. And then he finds a way through the competition block to figure out how to take those times down. You know, he went from 10.14 to 9.91. He went from 6.60 to 6.48. And I think a lot of the time that's happening because of his motor system figuring out how to race. He's refining and refining his racing model. He's taking all this sort of, you know, the stuff that doesn't quite make sense the stuff that, you know, he's, he's basically taking it from that sort of distribution and he's refining what he's doing neurally and he's getting it right and his body's figuring it out. And that's what I've seen him do over and over and over again. And I think it's just sort of being aware of what type of athlete you've got and how they're going to actually progress through the season. You know, how much of this lengthwise does it need to be versus how much of this and, and vice versa. And just sort of figuring out what athletes that you've got in your group and what's going to be most suitable for them.